Um, but they had the wires and those little curly Q things that the wires are attached to. So this guy invented those curly Q things. So I had a horse, and we always went to the country club and did all kinds of crazy things. This is when I was very young. Till I was about um, nine when they broke up and come to find out he owned everything that we had. Our house, the cars, my mother's business that she had been running, and we were thrown out into the street. So I went from like being this little country club horse riding girl to being homeless. We actually lived in the car for a little while. And um, developed like a really extreme intense class rage. <laughs> Uh, which I carry to this day, and it informed my uh, life's work and my choices up until this time. Uh, so then I was in college at UMass and um, became a student activist during the 80s um, when a lot of the students were organizing around uh, divestment and anti-apartheid work in South Africa. And from that, um, I kind of didn't go to class for a while and had great teachers who supported that. And then I left school and went to work for Jesse Jackson when he ran for president in 1988. And then I did a series of local and statewide electoral campaigns, but realized that all of the candidates and initiatives that I supported didn't have a strong base and we always lost. So I sort of consciously made the decision to move into community organizing so that we could build a base, a long-term base of low-income people, people of color who would have power the basic sort of tenet of community organizing. So I worked at a number of places, and then I went um, and created an organization, Anti-Displacement Project, which is now Alliance to Develop Power. And we were originally organizing tenants um, who lived in low-income housing that was at risk of losing its affordability uh, because of um, sort of federal laws. And so we had a big national federal campaign that resulted in a trigger that said if an owner wants to opt out of this federally subsidized housing, all of them, of course, they built all of this with none of their own money, um, but they could now sell it for market rate and reap windfall profits. Um, but we won this little caveat in the law that said if they want to sell it, they have to give the first right of refusal to the tenants or to a nonprofit that is endorsed by the tenants. So from that campaign, I sort of learned how important it is to figure out your handles and your triggers for future organizing drives where you'll be able to build power in the future. I think sort of another sort of current moment reflection is that a lot of the organizing that I see right now is very reactive and sort of very much in the moment and not strategically setting us up to build power. Um, so going back, we won this tenant and this, this caveat in the law and then we started organizing the same group of folks to take over their buildings. Um, most of the organizing that happened nationally partnered um, tenants with nonprofit community development corporations or nonprofit housing development corporations that would then buy them, <coughs> replace an out of town rich landlord with themselves. Didn't really make much difference in the lives of the people that lived there necessarily. Uh, but what we did is we organized um, our own nonprofits to purchase all the housing and to influence um, the decisions around repairs, around who works there. Um, and we did that in about 3,000 units in the western part of Massachusetts. Um, one day, we were sitting in a meeting after we had finished about four of these buyouts. And you guys will totally relate to this. <laughs> and uh, we were going over the operating budget, because now we owned all these properties, right? So now we have to run them, although you know we have no idea how to do it. But all good organizers are like, whatever, we'll figure it out. So we're having this meeting. We're going over the operating budget. And there was this guy named Terry Allen, who has since passed. He was a Vietnam vet, huge guy, like maybe 500 pounds. Scruffy, always wore a bandana. And we get down to the landscaping line item, and he said, why don't we mow the lawn? And in that moment, it was like the world exploded and lights were flashing and we realized that we were sitting on multi, multi millions of dollars worth of property, but of money. And that we had organized money to an extent that we now could control how capital was flowing in and out of our communities, all of the jobs that were created, all of the residual businesses that we did work with and use, and we could use that power economically but also politically. So we sort of changed the entire organization around um, and started creating new businesses um, that could then service the captive market of the housing 
Are you guys familiar with Mondragon at all in Spain? Some of you. So I'm not an expert on Mondragon, but um, it's in it's in the Basque region, and they started a business. It was after Franco, and there was huge poverty. And I think they started creating manufacturing a refrigerator part. Was it? A, it was a priest. Well, they certainly thing. do now, but I mean, they didn't I think start. It with... Started with that one part, though. Really? Oh well, they make refrigerators. I know. So it was one little part. And then they created a series of enterprises that then serviced that one part. And so now Mondragon is one of the largest, most expanding economies in the world. It's a cooperative. Um, certainly, it's, but it's, now it's a massive region and a whole economic system that is a number of cooperative businesses. There's a university. There's a bank. Um, and so the creative capital, the intellectual capital, the human and social capital, and the economic capital all flow together. So we started studying that, um, and we created a, a landscaping business, a painting business. Um, but at the same time, because we didn't want to become a, an economic development agency, and we didn't want to become a community development corporation, which I don't know if there's an experience in Canada with them, but in Massachusetts, they sort of were co-opted and lost all ability to wield power. Um, we said that all of, we're an organizing shop first. We're about leadership development, about building a base of low-income people who have a say over the decisions that affect their lives. Um, and so we would run campaigns and we would add to sort of the list of criteria for cutting an issue. Does this result in the creation of a new community-owned asset that will then broaden and expand the power of our community economy, we called it. So, for example, we started organizing immigrant workers in our region who were experiencing massive amounts of wage theft, particularly in the construction industry. At the same time, we have a project labor agreement with uh, the carpenters and with the building trades because we do lots of renovations in our properties and they hire our folks and train them and we agree to only use union labor. So we partnered with the trades and we said, we're going to organize immigrant workers. You need to agree to take them into the trades and change some of your guidelines around who gets to join the trades. We'll file wage and hour claims, but then we'll steal those workers and they'll come and work for our company. So that's also sort of like a, a corporate campaign that's a very commonly found tactic in labor organizing. So then we created a worker center that came out of this campaign that now has about 5,000 members, um, all of whom are immigrant members, most of whom are now uh, still working in the jobs they were in, but we've won the organization, I should stop saying we, has now won about $2 million in wage and hour claims. Um, and the landscaping and painting company expanded to doing light construction um, and now has about 75 employees who are earning a living wage. So the key for us was always combining a hard-hitting, impactful organizing campaign that would bring in a base that would make you know, real change in our region that would expand our relationships, but that would also build and expand our economic power at the same time. So there's lots of stories that I could tell that are similar to that. There's also a big green justice campaign that's still going on, and now there's um, an energy efficiency co-op that was started out of that and changed a number of the policies in Massachusetts around um, energy efficiency and, and this new law that was passed around the green justice work. Um, there's now a, a whole uh, food security campaign going on. So we went to folks and said, you know, where is your experience? What do you know? And people said, oh, I used to be a farmer before Monsanto ruined my land and I had to move here. So, oh, we have land now. So let's create a farm. And then other folks said, oh, well, um, I, you know, am a cook. So now there's this whole farm to fork thing going on where they're starting farms. They're going to open a cooperatively owned restaurant and uh, a bodega and maybe even look at some urban farming. So it's all about looking at sort of individual people and the assets that they have, how can you create a campaign that will affect structural change, but then also capture uh, the economic power that people are bringing. The best thing about this model that we created is that it generated revenue for our organizing. So the organization um, right now is supported by about a million dollars of internally generated revenue from the dues as well as from profits that are generated by the businesses. It's about, I think it's about 80%, 75% of the overall budget now. So that freed up the organization tremendously, got us off sort of the tit of the funders that control so much of the work that we do and changed their mind, oh, we have to work on this now and write this report even though you're busy doing this thing, which you know I 
goes back to my sort of class rage that I can't stand asking people for money or writing reports. Um, so fast forward, so I've been working at the national level with Van Jones for the last year and meeting with a number of folks. So there's this whole thing called the new economy that's sort of bubbling up. Um, there's lots of different sectors, right? So there's like community sustainable agriculture. There's uh, this thing called B Corp, which is a new way to start a corporation so that you don't just have to adhere to the needs of your shareholders, but there's like a triple bottom line. There's um, sort of the green people like Bill McKibben and 350.org who their sort of way that they come at it is not really through economic justice. It's more about the planet's going to die. What are you going to do about it? There's like the local, by local folks. Um, who also don't necessarily valley the business alliance of local living economies, I think, is their network. Um, then there's like the, the cooperative movement, which is still pretty small and not political in the United States. Like, oh, I work at a co-op and I'm cool, but I don't really care about anybody else. Um, and then there's sort of the community organizing shops that are continuing to think about what's happening in our economy. We're screwed. I mean, corporations are basically running everything. And our traditional models of organizing are not effective anymore, not as effective. Uh, so what do we do? So people are really starting to look at growing economies from the ground up. And there's this guy named Gar Alperowitz, uh, who I've been talking to. Do you know Gar? Sure. He's great. Do you like him? He's okay. Known him for a long time. Yeah. Um, I think that's a polite way of answering. It is. Yeah. It is. We'll move on. Um, but thinking about how can we bring all these different sectors together around one table and think about policy initiatives that can help scale this movement, whether it's at the local level, at the statewide level, or at the federal level. Um, how can we get community organizing groups to stop just being reactive? I mean, we have to save things. We have to fight against the bad things that are happening. But we also, again, need to go back and find these handles in our organizing campaigns that set us up for five years from now. But really think about economic power. and addition to people power. So the remittance campaign, I, I've, you know, we've talked about that mm -hmm. ad nauseum. I'm like obsessed with remittances, actually. Um, same thing with taxes. How can we generate revenue? How can we capture the power of our people and of their money? But really also build out a broader table of folks that are organizing together to win new policies. There's some examples going on right now, like the state bank fights that are happening, I think are crucially important to our work or some folks at the very local level are organizing at credit unions to try to take over their boards. Super, super important, very strategic. Thinking about um, where you are banking, if you are like raising money or if you're doing this tax fight uh, or your remittance fight, getting agreements with banks so that they, you can move your money into those banks um, and then you have more influence over the decisions that they're making. Um, you know, there's any number of initiatives that we could talk about, but I, that's sort of the model that I'm coming from, and I'm interested in talking to folks about different ways to be strategic, to get these handles in place, and then to spread the movement of really organizing and taking over different aspects of the economy from the ground up. The question that people always say, the naysayers, is, well, that's not scalable, um, which, you know, is true, but I, I'm kind of opposed to the word scale. I don't really like it. And I think what we can do locally, and if we can impact, be impactful in strategic areas, then the power of all of us together is actually what scale is. I think that's sort of Horn's view sure. on that as well. So that's sort of a, a wandering way for me to sort of lay the groundwork for what I've been thinking about. I don't, I don't know if that made sense. Absolutely. And, <laughs> you know, there are other groups like Push in Buffalo yep. uh, that's doing yes. things yep. that I know uh, has been in social policy and you're familiar with mm -hmm. them. Yep, they're great. They've been doing a lot of stuff around um, environmental and energy efficiency laws in New York um, and then getting folks into those jobs. And they're also taking over some houses um, and turning them into cooperatively owned institutions. They have some farms that they're working with as well. You know, what's interesting on that angle is, at least in the United States, we have, you know, some areas in the deindustrialized, uh, you know, cities um, where you can literally, uh, and, you know, when I was in Youngstown earlier this year, this is a good example where uh, uh, the Ohio Organizing Collaborative mm -hmm. had done a good job with uh, the Youngstown organization at getting some of the settlement money from banks was not just pissed away into the to the state budget, which is what happened to most of it, but actually used to mm -hmm. help turn over the property. And 
uh, you've got if they had an organizing plan, you could take over huge amounts of property. They're trying to figure out, at the mm -hmm. point I was there, how do you come up with a maintenance plan, essentially to mow the yard, like you're talking right. about, instead of owning the property. And then you figure out, I ran into somebody who bought literally six acres in, down, in the city of Detroit to yeah. farm. I mean, how, uh, in fact, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, Laura, who was with us in Bolivia, mm -hmm. her sister's boyfriend, <laughs> it turns out, uh, <laughs> you know, it's all, you know, theory of, of weak links, uh, bought six acres to do this commercial farming operation yeah. in the city of Detroit. There are more pheasants that grow in, per acre in the city of Detroit now than grow in rural Michigan. I mean, I, I, mean, I just, crazy. you know, so the notion, and I, you know, I keep trying to enlist, uh, my friends at A Community Voice for why we should do a similar project in Lower Ninth Ward, where there's still, you mm -hmm. know, too much property then, and households are a long way, but you could start using that to supply uh, farm goods. And obviously, around this table, uh, you know, they're used to the fact that I now start my uh, reports on that the year I'm meeting on Acorn International by what, another year has gone by when I didn't write a proposal, <laughs> you know. So we're yes. up to Fairgrind supporting all five of our Central American offices. So um, that's, and that's not, God, I wish we were generating a million dollars worth of profits like ADP. I'm ready for that we day. Have to do that. But that's a long, I mean, how many years did that take? 18? Yeah, it took 18 years. <laughs> so, but I actually think 18 years, that's, it's, I don't think that's, that's that worth long. it. That's a yeah. short run for a million bucks. I mean, yeah. I hate to tell you and what kind of international operation we you know, could run on the As I talk to my friends and my colleagues and folks like you, they say we don't, we don't, we we're organizers. We don't want to run stuff, right? So like the the model that I was raised up in is, you win stuff and then you hold them accountable to do it, right? And you kick their ass and then you you hold them accountable and you have all these you know follow up meetings. But this is why I'm saying, like, I think we need to shift change and think about we should be running things. Well, and Acorn's never had that problem. And we mm -hmm. believe in building institutions, whether it's labor union. Mm -hmm. I mean, it tends to be things that are closer to our historic base. Labor union, social policy. I mean, without those things, I mean, people like me couldn't get paid. But, and, you know, within the community organizing model, um, you know, certainly, whether it's tax centers or yeah. the EITC work or dues or, you know, all those things. The problem that Acorn had towards the end was 15, you know, in the first 15 years we'd gotten up to about 65% internally funded. Mm -hmm. Once we sort of were in 38 states and 100 different offices, mm -hmm. that same level of dues and internal income didn't keep up with the expansion of the overall program, particularly when the housing stuff, right. which was right. a big number, and the unions, which were big numbers. So then all of a sudden you're down to 50% or whatever, and look what happened in 2010. That wasn't when they were attacked in terms of their outside money. They didn't have enough confidence in their internal systems to survive. Right. Um, so we're intrigued by all this stuff, and uh, but I don't think, and we, we had, uh, you know, great conversations this morning about just this question in Canada was how they, get the lift to build sustainable operations as they prepare the platform mm -hmm. to expand outside of the four or five places they are now to the whole, mm -hmm. you know, country. Um, so we're intrigued now. Uh, so the internal revenue now is coming from where? Or is, is there any yet? Is there a plan? Right. Is, what, are your, what is your thinking about that? Well, well dues are still. Yeah, dues. we do. Yeah. Well, you know, 17% comes from dues and canvassing. And That's good. I mean, yeah, it's not bad, but then there's still the other 83% that comes from like a, a like a intensive union hustle and foundations and credit unions. But in Canada, it does not have the robust foundation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we may not like the foundations we have in the United States, but we have a plethora compared to Canada. Right, there's right, very right. few because they have a fair tax system. So you get a lot more money from unions. Our unions are weaker, so they're not putting out much money. But you know, so that's uh, that's a major source. And they're painful, though. They make you fucking work for it. Like mm -hmm. every year, you're just going back asking for another thousand dollars. So you know, we have like I don't know, thirty different unions that support us, but like we got to work for it. Mm -hmm. So it's good, but it's hard. 
I'm just like that group in Winnipeg that read Lee Staples' book that then did one community organizing drive and then thought, let's just take over the credit union and then organize to take over the Winnipeg, um, like this Assiniboine credit union. And then, and then they kind of panicked because they had to run it. Yep. And then they never did another organizing drive and they ran camp education campaigns. But I mean, So what happened with the credit union? I don't know exactly. But they took it over. We don't work in Winnipeg. And they created a bunch of resources for themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should take over a credit union in Ontario because Alterna sucks and they won't give us any money. Yeah. Read. Okay. What's the name? We'll look. I mean, the, this, Mondraga, I mean, what, what, the Mondragon program has 100,000 workers. So you're talking about a huge cooperative enterprise <laughs> that, in fact, is concerned about what happens when they can't compete in making refrigerators now. So they do a state of the art, you know, iron press operation. I talked to organizing director for the ILWU, just was there this spring. Um, but they're, you know, very sophisticated, huge employment, all cooperative. You know, Basque has obviously had a different relationship to the whole Spanish, you know, Republican system. Right. Um, but it's been a, you know, huge model has this, uh, you know, the Japanese uh, system of cooperatives, which uh, we talked about a little bit earlier. So we just don't, I mean, what we have in the United States, at least on the cooperative side, the bigger co cooperatives are virtually indistinguishable from regular companies. So Land O'Lakes Butter is a huge cooperative, mm -hmm. but who would know? I mean, it's out of Minnesota. Yeah, there's a bunch in Minnesota. It's a whole Well, it's that whole populist, Norwegian, right? you know, whatever, that whole, you know, Northern European, European thing. It's interesting, just going back to the credit union conversation, because here we had a big move your money thing that's gone on a, a few mm -hmm. times. Did you guys do that in Canada? Are you familiar about, with it? Yeah. So it was like days when people would go and move their money from the big banks mm -hmm. to local banks or to credit unions. Some faith-based groups are getting their, their churches to move their money. There's been some effort to get whole municipalities to move their money. They haven't been quite as successful. But what's missing there, again, goes back to the sort of longer-term strategy. They're just moving their money into these local banks or into credit unions without any power demands over these banks of what they're going to do with it. So it's just, I don't, it's, well, I mean, we it was a big thing a in the U.S. So you, you know, the credit union terms are as predatory as yeah. banks. I mean, exactly. all of a sudden you're getting a half a point. I mean, it's yeah. not like credit unions you remembered, you know, from some romantic book or something. I mean, all of a sudden you're looking at, you know, sky high interest rates, you know, charges for everything imaginable. Mm -hmm. $50, you know, bad check. I mean, you know, I might as well have my money in Bank America or something. At least so. then you get to use all their ATMs. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, I mean, how can we, that's another thing I've been talking to folks about, like this, this campaign is very short-sighted. It's kind of a feel-good thing that the funders love and they get to tweet about it all the time, but it doesn't really matter in, yeah. the, in the, the long and short of it. So how can we talk about money in ways that actually matter? And we're fighting up against these massive corporations. Like, what can we do that really matters? I mean, that's like the question of the hour, where we really are taking control over something. I don't know. I'd love to hear more about your remittance campaign, because Western Union, of course, is horrendous. Yeah, it's a lot of money that's moving, you know, out of Canada, and they're just gouging, you know. Yeah. Like, they're doing a big, whatever it is, like 10%, 5% gouge. Um, so Ontario, you know, uh, led the Acorn International ranks. They had a, they got a, a members bill introduced, uh, an, NB, an NDP -er in, in Ontario. I, need, uh, I don't know whose PowerPoint said introduced, supported, killed, or whose PowerPoint was that? Was that? Toronto. Analysis. It was killed because the legislature I understand. was prorogued, uh -huh. so not killed, sure. not singled out. A lot of them were killed. Right. So, so once again, though, it's a campaign that's trying to get them to do the right thing instead of creating a new entity, an alternative right. entity that does the right thing that we then have power over. Well, I mean, scale is still both. important. It is. But we need to do both. There's yeah, but on that, on new that you're talking about billions of dollars that are de desperately have to be changed right now. So yeah. you don't, I mean, if you took the the Tigre approach and just tried yeah. to make a very small deal about a very small amount of money with a very small credit union, you're not, you're, unfortunately, you're not 
You're not creating income for the support of the organization, which would have justified that, and you're not creating change. So, although we're not opposed to that in this area because it links all of our countries together where we work, it's so much, so much money, mm -hmm. so many billions of dollars that uh, we really do have to change the system. So this bill is yeah. may be introduced in BC. We think if we get a change of government, <laughs> John's on top of that. We're hoping to come back in Ontario. Uh, once the government changes, we have something coming forward in Honduras, uh, uh, and we had a whole project in Mexico. So we're trying to raise this up in all of our countries. It's our first, you know, semi-genuine international campaign. But it's not one where we're going to probably just say, hey, we'll make a deal with a, this XYZ credit union. But have you thought about creating your own remittance service at the same time I have also talked to our brother with Tigre, you know, uh, uh, every year. When I'm in the Bay Area, I sit down and try to see if they've made any progress. And, and like, what do they say? I don't really know what's going on with that. Well, he had a, you know, the, here's the high water point is that uh, Francis, uh, this is a program around remittances. Tigre is run by a guy named Francis Colpatera, who's originally from the Philippines. He's worked uh, with Gary Delgado and many of us for a long, long time, and he's had this, you know, sort of one-man band on this particular issue. And what they have, their, the, their biggest success is they, because their migrant labor is such a huge source of the GNP in the Philippines, uh, they've convinced the new government in the Philippines over the last 12 months that there will be a half day in which they will invite, you know, people in to talk about what's the most cost-effective way to remit your money back to the Philippines. Because as we've discussed, it is in that country's interest not to just make the deals with Money Mark and Western Union, but actually to see how much money they can retain that's coming from their migrant laborers and immigrants back to the domestic economy. So. To some small degree, the Philippines government now gets that and was organizing this sort of, you know, three-hour time in which an affiliate that Francis is, you know, connected to, and they have a, a half-time or something staff person over there who goes in and they talk about this thing. They, but thus far, they still <coughs> only have, like, really, and you know, I don't know, uh, I missed him in June, so this was about six months old, but they had one, one credit union. We've offered to do a pilot here in Toronto, here in Toronto, we're in Boston, but in Toronto with Acorn Canada, we've offered to do a pilot a number of times where if we had somebody triangulate, Medina. huh? I thought Medina did that. Medina? Yeah. Who's with Medina? Fran. She was from uh, Kajikistan, and she was in contact with Francis. Yeah, I don't know. He said he never was able to get any of his partners to be willing to do a pilot in Canada. So I don't know how Medina did that. But um, and then we talked to Van City about you know they wanted they have a deal in the Philippines, and we said we would do uh, if if they could get their Philippine product within the range of what we saw as non predatory charges, we would actually try to move uh, Filipinos in the Ontario area into the thing. And at this point, Ben City, which is a, a cool, you know, is a credit union, our big supporter in, in Vancouver for our tax program, the single largest funder for John's operation in Vancouver, they still don't have their Philippines operation mm -hmm. up to where it can be. And that was what? When did we meet with him? A year and a half, two years ago almost? Two years ago. He sends me an email every six months. Well, we're getting close. I mean, you know, it's a, so we just, and we're not, Wait, what print? Yeah. The other thing, too, is that, it's not the BC, it's um, remittance legislation, it's federal, it's just this BC guy was moved by the BC members to do a motion federally around, well, we're writing the motion with them right now, so, and it's around banking legislation. I mean, it's a motion coming from the NDP because they don't want to do a private members bill because it's a majority conservative government and they're not going to win, but they're thinking that they can write a motion to create some sort of review federally looking into how to regulate the banking industry around this. So this would be the moment to get that in there. So any brilliant ideas? But at this point, those institutions are still, re remittances are still regulated provincially, not federally. 
not in the banks, if it's through no, right. the banks, the Banking Act is federal, money transfer. So you're talking about for the banks? Talking for the banks. And you'd also, right. Peter Julian also said that if the federal government wanted to, they could. That's what the, the member of parliament, the, the bank. Yeah. Anyway, he said they if wanted they wanted to, they, they could. could. They could regulate everything they could just federally. Regulate everything. Without legislation, they could administratively well, they, decide to do it. The only they thing that's difficult is that Quebec has already tried to, to put, in, put in a law two years ago to say that they wanted the ability to regulate remittances. They haven't particularly, but they've tried to preempt this it. This is all stuff we all don't really know. I yeah. Well, we that. definitely know they passed a bill well, we know mentioning rem that they were going to do remittances in the provincial government in Quebec. Yes. We know that. That's true. What I said, what I meant to say was what we don't know is um, whether or not they would be able to do it federally. Just one magic. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Sure. <laughs> I, I don't know. Or they might have a, a joint system where they could do provincially and federally. Well, but we don't have the political alignment to do that. That's right. the bottom line. That's the point. Yeah. So and one of the other we, projects that we did was we worked with, um, there's this whole prepaid debit thing <coughs> do, which is also like massively predatory. Mm -hmm. What's that guy's name? Yeah. He's like a Buddhist now. He's yeah. Russell Simmons. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, you I mean, read my mind. We negotiated with Russell yeah, a million times. It is predatory such card. a ripoff. No, 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 we couldn't exactly. touch it. It's a horribly predatory card. <laughs> Um, so but so we said, okay, we want to have our own card. And so it was branded. We had a little hot stamp, it's called, with our logo on it. And we marketed them to our members and said, look, you can bypass the banks, bypass, you know, people who are unbanked, people who are underbanked, uh, can now you have a card. And it's a prepaid debit card. And the card that we created as part of this pilot, um, you could get two. And there was like a savings pouch so that you could give one card to someone in your home country and you could transfer money, and this way it was for free because it was through your online banking account. Um, and so that for us was a way to completely bypass Western Union and provide services to our folks who needed it. There was also very small fees attached to this card, like non-predatory, they were actually not high enough in my estimation, um, and those fees went to our organization. So it was also a source of internally generated revenue. So for us it was a benefit of membership, it was a marketing tool to bring in new members, solved a problem that lots of people have where they need to be banked, um, and it brought in a small amount of revenue. The problem with that was that the company that we were working with, Account Now, needed to get more cards on the street in order to keep the program going, and we weren't able to get enough cards on the street because it was very high touch, like you have to have a relationship. Yeah. They're not just gonna like randomly hand you their money or go to your office and put it in your little machine. So it was very relational for us. Um, and they were like, just, you know, tell them to go to Green Dot. And we were like, no, we want to bring in members. <laughs> but I think that there's potential to, to think about that, um, doing it in a different way. The other problem, just sort of in our reflection from that program, is that people in the receiving end, you had to go to an ATM machine mm. to get the money. And there, in lots of places, there are none. So I would like to figure out a way to do that with mobile phones. The problem we had on a pilot we did with Banamex and Citibank is that with the Banamex network was hugely based on ATMs in Mexico. Mm. People didn't have enough experience. Yeah. And uh, so unless you had somebody who, who could right. navigate you through the system on the ATM in Mexico, it just didn't work. Yeah. So even if even on the card switching system we had mm -hmm. and this, that and the other, we just and even, there are lots of people that don't even live near an ATM, so, you know, particularly our folks in like Honduras are like, well, there's no ATM, this isn't working. I gotta well, go and, and, that's, <laughs> and the problem we've had in Honduras is getting, yeah, you exactly. know, any, any, uh, anybody to be able to, to handle remittances at a lower cost. I mean, it's, this should be, I mean, if we could, here's what I believe. If we ever could win the remittance campaign, I think we could handle a transactional side on downstream mm -hmm. for how to do something that helped the organization. But to think that you can impact the remittance campaign on these small efforts that involve, you know, 100 people here and 1,000 people there mm -hmm. and a couple of dollars here, I just don't think too many of them end up soiling the organization because they're as predatory as so you're fighting, you end up, def you know, defending you know, and these companies are going in and out of business like. Yeah, that's true. Um, so that just hasn't, I mean, we're not ideologically opposed to it. It's just not a place where we can put time, energy, and resources at this point. Mm -hmm. and none of the 
millions of small companies. I mean, we didn't announce the predatory, uh, the uh, predatory campaign. We didn't announce the, <laughs> the remittance campaign before Judy had somebody knocking on her door willing to offer a deal in Toronto, right? Oh, people contact me all the time. Yeah, still are. Well, we, oh, we, don't, like sending, like, we don't even talk about it anymore, obviously. But yeah. So we get pitched a lot. I got pitched in the U.S. by a whole bunch of people. But it's just, you know, there, there's, there's two tracks. And obviously, uh, we are, are uh, sympathetic to the, your track about how to organize money. Realistically, we're very interested in those things that, you know, move financing and sustainability to organizations. That's small scale. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but they, it's hard to necessarily put both of them together. I mean, right. Yeah, well, it's like a chicken and egg thing. Oh, I think that's such an unfortunate metaphor. I think um, you should do both at the same time, personally. That's different than chicken and egg. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think people think it's a chicken and an egg thing. First you do this, and then you can do that. But there's always going to be a million of this, right? There's always a million problems. So right. how do you choose? And so this was sort of the story that I told was my thinking was always, oh, you... You can do both at the same time, and you keep fighting to, for systemic change, right. and then you create something that's a quote-unquote alternative as a result of that, that then has a base of people who are educated and empowered and are committed to following through because it's a win for them. And then they want to run the institution long-term. But you can't just sort of say, oh, here, we know that this is a problem, we're going to solve it by giving you a product, because that sort of gets to the whole economic development world where you don't actually work with people that say that they want your product. So it's all, you know, you could also say you're organizing the market at the same time. If you want to use sort of this In our paying language. lending legislation, I think we had some stuff written into our demands around, you know, financing of financial literacy for community groups, but we lost those pieces. Mm -hmm. And those are window dressing in a lot of cases. I mean, they don't. Did you ever talk to any of the, the credit unions or the local banks about doing low interest loans as an alternative to payday lending? We don't really have local banks, but we did talk to Van City about At length, it. yeah. And they they were like they were wanting to do this whole card thing through us. But they never has Elizabeth brought that up recently? Well that's what that No. And that gets us to the talk about the tax site too that the card would all be linked into the tax site, where people then would be able to give instant loans. You'd get everyone would get a debit card. It would have the Acorn logo. If people got an instant loan, we'd, they'd get, get a fee. The, to, like there would be a fee charge for mm -hmm. getting the money instantly. That money would come to Acorn. Then we'd start, you know, then obviously, you know, paying for taxes and stuff would be a <coughs> different thing. But things would, but not would be a different thing. The money would be there on the card. I think you could do a lot of stuff with the card. I'm not a banker. That's not my strong point, but they go on about that, and I don't know. I kind of think the more serious we get um, with them, the more we need to press for that. They have some way of just talking about uh, this, how they were um, unleashing their Filipino remittance thing. I think all of this is kind of tied up. They're redoing their whole banking system. I have no idea what this they're is talking like so we, we had extensive no negotiations about how to do this in, in 07 and 08 with H&R Block mm -hmm. as part of our renewal discussions. They created a bank, the H&R Block Bank, and we desperately wanted them to com compete with payday lending. They'd actually talked to Sheila Baer mm -hmm. uh, at the FDC about uh, who was seek trying to seek financial institutions. This is all in the U.S. Um, who were willing to compete with the major payday lending companies that operate in the U.S. that we'd been fighting. And we thought we had a, you know, a pretty aggressive uh, system that would let us partner on that. And as it turned out, the, the CEO, there was a board coup and he got thrown out and so did everybody who was negotiating with us. But the long and short of it is that, uh, H, you know, in the beauty thing about tax preparation is that there is almost a 75% recidivism. If yeah. you do somebody's taxes year A, there's 75% chance that you're going to get that same person come back to you, regardless of fees charged. Because I got to read all of the confidential H&R Block, you know, mm -hmm. marketing data. Regardless of fees charged, they're going to come right back to you because now they trust your ass. You're not stealing from them, so you're worth five, 10, 20. You're worth a premium. You're definitely worth money. You're definitely not working free. 
So H&R Block had that going with them. So what they wanted to do with us was essentially expand radically, because their base is lower income working people. And that's what we ended up finding out in the campaign was that we were organizing. The reason why we were able to get them to negotiation so quickly is because their base was our base. And yeah, and they're a horrible predatory lender, too. Compared to what they were before we started the campaign, they are better. Now they've gone back the other they're, way. They've gone back, yeah. No. They're that's, like, that's, but the tax they refund do. stuff is like 400% of well, I mean, you get your quick refund. I think it's on a card even. Yeah. Tell me more about, so you're thinking you could get a, a card. Where would the, it would come from that credit union? Van City would. You can get a card from anybody. The technology is yeah. above. You can get a card from anybody. But they would. And the tax would people love to load a card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would load a card. We would right. get loaded cards. And so what no. we were negotiating, like an H&R Block, same thing with Van City, is that you would get an account rather than having to load a card. So you wouldn't have to pay the card transaction. You'd get a, a low-cost mm -hmm. card. No, what they're talking about is we would have cards would be in it. We'd load the cards. That's what that's what Elizabeth's talking about. I also don't know. You were talking with a different person than me. I'm not. Quite yeah, sure. H and R Block. I'm talking about. Oh, you're talking about H and R Block. Yeah, that's the equivalent. Oh, they, they load yeah. cards in an H and R Block case. You got an account because you got a bank in Van City. I think it was just a card, as you say, right? Yeah. And the advantage of an account is you're not paying the processing fees of a card. Do you find that people being unbanked or underbanked in your area? Is Out of our tax lines, it's probably around, uh, yeah, 20% would be, would or be like, I don't have a bank account, so they go to Money Mart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think and then that's part of what we'd be, part of the, the selling, I think, if we would, you'd think if we were able to have the cards in the off, uh, the, be able to load the cards, they'd be able to open a bank account. But then all, all the, but they're also talking about having these community hubs and us working out of their branches and stuff. It's, we, this is all just kind of pie in the sky stuff, but mm -hmm. at this point. And it's, I mean, it's also worth notice, noting that like that 20% of unbanked people, whatever, that we deal with are, when they moving money around, they're going through Western Union right. and being yeah. charged the same rate as if they're yep. sending it to like Peru. Yeah. So when the provincial government told me that they would probably totally regulate that. In the U.S., the problem mm -hmm. became different than Canada. The whole regulations post 9-11, terrorism, Al-Qaeda, and whatever, is that they didn't want us to be able to load the cards in our Acorn service centers because they had to have a bank official there. That yeah, that's not an issue anymore. I mean, our card, that was, we were a loading site. How is you that? You have to get a certain amount of insurance. Pardon me? You needed insurance. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to have, you know, approved systems. So we had to do a bank drop every night. and But we were an of official site. And the key to the card product that we had. With the deal you made with your, your with provider. With our account now. You didn't have to have a social security number to get the card. So it bypassed a lot of the post 9-11 restrictions. So that was key. You know, we said this is, these are the requirements for our members to be able to use this card. And since we were negotiating with banks on this, right. like H&R Block's bank, and like Citibank or whatever, Literally in New York, they tried to negotiate a system where they were sending a bank officer mm -hmm. on a daily basis for a while to be there to help open accounts and to load the cards and other places. So we kept trying to keep, we knew they would never make the commitment to have a, a you know, it doesn't, the numbers don't work out to have a, a paid banking official at a, an no. Acorn tax site. No, and it also would be insane. It'd be crazy. We don't worry. Yeah. Okay. okay. But that, I wouldn't, if they wanted to pay for it and they really okay. would do it, and I thought it was financial, okay. what do I care? But you just know they're never going to pay, you know, somebody to be there every night and whatever, yeah. or, or they wanted us to have everybody come back a second time to open their account. You know, none of that worked But with out. the advent of online, these, these, so these are accounts, but they're only online. It's an online checking account, technically, is what it is. Mm -hmm. And there's all these new companies, and the regulations are actually quite different than with a regular banking institution. And well, sure the, the, the host site, so for the loading center, we had to have a minimum balance. Um, and then we put in policies like you can only load. This was another problem that we had, actually. We wouldn't let someone load a check, because so many of our members um, worked for scumbag, unscrupulous employers who would you know, give them bad checks. So we're like, yeah, we're not going to take that guy's check. So they would have to go cash the check, and then we, we would only load cash. And that was how we made sure that we always had enough money in our, you had to have like a revolving fund account to cover the balance of all of your deposits. Mm -hmm. 
So for folks that then what we wanted to bypass predatory check cashing operations, but our product wasn't solving that problem right. because we were only taking cash. So I think I think that there you know there's this you know Walmart is now entering into this world. They have yeah. a new prepaid card. Um, we went to a bunch of conferences around like with the prepaid world. The money that we actually got to fund this pilot program actually came in a circuitous route, but it started with Walmart. Um, and for them, it was market research. So I, I will say, and if someone repeats this, I'll deny that I said it, um, that we falsified all of our reports back to them. So it was like the opposite. So their market research that they paid for was incorrect. What, what happened to but, the but, whole but thing? But now the they're, they're moving into the space. We went to all these conferences, and it's like, because this is like, the, they're huge, you know, they've sucked all of the money out of all of us that they can. They're looking for new markets. For them, the new markets are unbanked people and immigrants. So CCC paid what's her name to do all this research. I was talking to her at the same time, and they did. Janice Fine. Yeah. Jan no, not Janice Fine. Yes, Janice Fine. Mm -hmm. Janice Fine. Is that it? Janice Fine started this whole card project as a way to generate and revenue with the New for Jersey worker centers. Work okay, so what all happened? It all when I've asked her, if that's, you know. Oh, I'll tell you what happened. She said it so, all blew up, but I never could get any details. Yeah. But you um, weren't part of that. Yes, that was my project. So we okay. ended up running that national pilot. We took it over. Um, so the, f the first idea was working with worker centers, um, <coughs> with mostly immigrant members. Um, how can people generate membership revenue? So you get a card as a benefit of membership, and then your dues gets deducted from the card. That was the original concept. Oh. Very handy. And then the card has your logo on it, which oh was my God. personal favorite. Um, so then we, a bunch of, you know, people did a bunch of research, there was way too much foundation money that was put into it, and the research was n flawed, and it really wasn't talking to people on the street who actually would have experience with it, which is why it was flawed, of course. So we went through, I think, three iterations of the card. And then finally, there were five groups nationally that participated in the pilot. The money came to my former organization, and we ran the pilot with this card. Um, and so it was like it was like a dollar loading fee, and like my organization got, gave like the thing like you know you buy ten cups of coffee you probably do this at Fairgrounds and then you get the stamp and then the eleventh one is free so we had no, to load card I load, your, for every cup. load your card ten times and then the eleventh time is free so we had all kinds of like fun things and then we gave if you brought in five people five of your people in your network to get the card then you would get like a $10 donation that would go back to your card. So there were all kind, we tried to gamify it and have incentives because it was really about building relationships and bringing new people into the organization. So you would come in, you do an orientation, you'd get the card. And then your dues would be deducted off the card um, monthly. Um, we also, for our organization, we, we marketed the card to people that were receiving public benefits, social security, welfare, whatever. So they would get a direct deposit onto the card um, because it's not just the number of cards that you put out on the street. That's what the partner entity account now was looking for to make their money. But it's also how often they use it. So we had to encourage people to keep using their cards. So the education component at a staff level, which is why you needed to have relationships, was very, very <coughs> high. It's not just financial literacy, but it's like, okay, use your card to do this, to do that. Make sure that you get cash back so you don't get a fee if you're just going to the ATM to get money. So that was, um, in retrospect, from a staffing level, it took up more time than we anticipated. Um, but it did bring in a lot of members. They had to cash it before they put the money on it, so that was a problem. People on the receiving end of the extra, the second card, many of them weren't, didn't have access to an ATM. That was a problem. Um, but it did solve the problem of people who were unbanked or underbanked. It did solve the remittance fee problem of people that did have access to an ATM. Um, and it did generate a small amount of revenue for us. There were five other, four other groups that did it. Um, for the ones that were pure immigrant-based worker centers, their population was very transient. They, they migrate, right, according to the work and the season. So they would leave. So their use of the card over time dwindled. Mm -hmm. And so then the company was like, oh, screw this. This isn't, this isn't worth it for us. Then there was the Filipino Worker Center, um, and they actually, I think they did the Tigrid program. So they did something different. And then there was the Worker Center in Long Island, what is it called? The Workplace Project? Yeah. I think they did a separate boutique card with their credit union. Um, 
So the pilot went on and then account now pulled out primarily because the continued uses of the card were very low, except for in our organization where we had 700 cards on the street that were getting used all the time. And did you keep, did the ADP keep the program going? No, because it was part of this larger program and account now wouldn't So what it. Janice always said to me is, oh, the company pulled out. It didn't meet the, company the representations did end up that it made. Okay. Right, and so what I was so saying I is I want to run true. this national program. We figured out at our organization how to make the card work, and we want to spread it, and we, I think that we could have been successful, which is why it's still sort of in my mind. I want to, yeah, I, hear that. I still want to figure out a product that will solve some of the problems that we identified from our evaluation. I think that our members need it, and I think it's a way to generate revenue. How much money did you bring in on a monthly basis for the cards? For the organization's the revenue? Yeah. It was very small, um, and it also, so when you first got the card, you paid a, you know, it was a few thousand a month. Okay. When you got the card, there was a higher fee, right, to get it, and then it was all about loading it. Right. So it was, like a, it was like a dollar a load. I actually didn't run that part of the program, so I don't know actually what the fees were, but it was a few thousand bucks a month. That's fine. It's great. And for us, it's having so it be a, a benefit of of membership was the key thing. Mm. But at, you know, as it as it flattened out, it, it didn't really work anymore. We needed to keep expanding saying, and getting scale. Two thousand dollars of income yeah. against staffing costs. Yeah, yeah. Which the costs of running the program were enormous. So yeah, don't all of a sudden see that as net. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> just being clear here, I'm just being clear, just keeping the simple math together. But yeah, and, but also, you know, you, you measure the benefits in lots of different ways, right? So there's income, but there's also sure. how many new members are you bringing in? Right. Well, and Caroline's, you know, guessing that if she, she'd been able to smooth it out over, mm -hmm. the, you know, several years, she might have gotten in a position where she was in good shape, and that's why you do those things, so I understand that. Yeah, and we had to have, like, an administrator at the office at the loading site, like, a whole new staff person just to, like, do that like our own little personal banker <laughs> oh boy yeah yeah let, let's talk more about farming <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know the problem with uh, the good thing about interest rates being so low is that you know people have a chance of home ownership if they're if the banks are ever losing credit the bad thing about interest rates being low is it makes almost all collective financial schemes not viable today credit unions you know, you can't do the math at what scale you'd have to have in deposits to generate at 1% or, or whatever people are getting for money, mm -hmm. how to run operating costs on a credit right. union, which yeah. is why, you know, these actions that Caroline's talking about, I mean, we, we rent, a, a, you know, our office in New Orleans, now we rent from a credit union. So I dutifully went down and said, ah, you know, they're gonna let us in because we're now in their building, I'll finally join a credit union. Oh my God, I couldn't believe how exp you know how expensive it was. how expensive it was yeah. I was essentially making a five hundred dollar it was minimum five hundred dollar donation to to get you know killed on this thing it, we were at one point we were doing a campaign targeting labor ready the day labor agency you guys yeah. had that right yeah, that. Um, yeah. they sued us for racketeering blah 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 it was a big deal and so we actually won some legislation in Massachusetts that capped the amount of fees that. Uh, temp agencies are allowed to charge so that they can't make you go below minimum wage, which I didn't even know that that was allowed, but then we won it, and I was like, oh, well, that's a good thing. Um, but so coming out of that campaign, we wanted to create our own worker owned temp agency. Similar result of that was we said, oh, well, now we know why they charge all these fees, because you, you can't make any money off of a temp agency. That's huge. And that's why they charge the fees. That's, that's the profit margin is right there. But other than that, you don't really make any money. So in that case, we did all this research. We had the base. We were like moving forward. And we said, oh, OK, forget it. We're not going to do this. Because it won't really be a viable alternative to the existing system. Mm -hmm. hmm. So you know, when you're thinking about creating an alternative, something, you have to really do your research and think, is it going to build a membership? Is it going to solve the problem? Is it going to bring in revenue? And, and like, really, you have to do a business plan. Is it viable? Now, I wouldn't say you have to do a business plan the way like the Yale Business School says you have to do it. A lot of it is actually kind of common sense. So, you know, a lot of what we do in organizing is demystifying things. And and like you already said, I'm not a banker, but you know what? You bank, and you intuitively you kind of know if you're getting screwed over. That's like really the best place to start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know I'm gonna it takes me a while to figure it out. And then once you've talked to folks and you know what the problem is and what the solution is, you can just pay a consultant to execute what you want. Like, you don't need to know that part, but you do, you can figure out the problem and the solution and you just pay someone to do the details. 
So are you recommending people look at the housing kinds of ventures you are involved in? As, uh... Yeah, so um, I would say absolutely. I mean, through the tenant organizing, you know, we, our mantra was sort of like, we don't just want you to fix the toilets, we want to we wanna own the toilets so they never break again. Um, and that was like, people really like grabbed onto that. Um, I can tell you sort of the enemy is the nonprofit housing industry in the United States, particularly in New England and in Massachusetts is uber powerful and democratic contributors for the most part. Um, and they're very paternalistic and they'll say things like, they won't raise their own rent, or they'll keep the money, or they'll do bad things. Well, I'll be like, well, but everybody makes bad choices. Like, poor people have the right to make bad choices as much as rich people. Rich people make plenty of bad choices. Um, and you need to just keep organizing and all organizing is reorganizing. So it's super labor intensive. For us, there was a, a couple of important learnings. Um, so one is we hired an outside management company. You have to have a, a contract with them that is hyper vigilant and gives you all power at all times so like our company that we hired um, and we went through like four of them we fired a whole bunch of them and then they tried to take the property over from us the contract that is now in place says that the ADP board so it's the, the co-op board not just that individual tenant association board has the hiring and firing rights and that they have to hire to work in the properties whoever we say because they would also hire people that didn't believe in the mission that would then work counter to us. Mm -hmm. So the day-to-day -day hiring and firing was super, super important for us. Another thing that I would say is building in um, an ongoing leadership development program that's really focusing on moving from opposition to governance is really important. Because we trained people to kick ass, and then it was like, oh, wait. We have to govern now. It's like a teeny bit of a different skill set. <laughs> Once you're running things, it's like, stop fighting. <laughs> we have to be cooperative. Um, and we, we didn't anticipate that. So we would be like, oh, we need to go find an outside enemy. We have to go find somebody to kick the shit out of so that they would f stop fighting with themselves. Yeah. Um, so th those two things are super important. And then the, the third thing I would say is around procurement. Um, so the entities that we created were all nonprofits. So actually, there's four things. Um, as nonprofits, and I'm not sure what the rules are in Canada, I would assume that they're similar. Nonprofits are regulated like in idiotic and stupid ways. Um, so you can't do business with an identity of interest company, and you have to get like three bids and take the lowest bid. So like if we were going to say we want to on a government contract, we want to no even internally. If we want to build a fence, because we were because we were HUD regulated, because we were regulated by the government, we had Section Eight. They would okay, say so you have to get three. Those are governmental yeah. rules. Yeah. Those aren't you have to get rules. three. We have to get three bids. We can, so we can do business. We just have to use all the profits to go back into the mission of the organization. Right. Yeah, exactly. So what happened to us is this horrible company bid against our own landscaping company, and of course we gave the bid to our own company. And then they said that we were like dealing private in Europe, and they accused us of all these things, and we got investigated by the attorney general. So you have to be really careful about the way that money flows. Yeah. Um, and we said we're never going to hire this company. They use labor ready and. We had to campaign against Labor Ready and they abused their workers. There's a reason why our company costs more because we provide a better service and we pay a higher wage. How did you win the buildings again, though? Um, so, so those are the four lessons. So like opposition to governance and then make them not be nonprofit because make them be LLCs. And you did that. Acorn was not all nonprofits, right? We were just a straight nonprofit. Oh, well, we, so we are now, that organization is changing all of its ownership entities to be limited liability corporations. So that they're now not, there's they're a new not thing regulated like we set up a fair grind, which is a L3C, which is a limited low profit mm -hmm. liability yeah. corporation. But non profit which is like regulations a are social idiotic. venture, social enterprise within mm -hmm. the LLC yeah. empire. And I don't know if every state has it, but they're. I, I, Louisiana has it, Massachusetts yeah. is bound to, but I think Fair Grind was the first L3C in Louisiana. And there's a B Corp thing. Do you guys have B Corp in Louisiana? It's pretty there's cool. There's no advantages compared to an L3C. So how do we organize the tenants to do it? So again, first we won this law. So it's like what we're saying. It's a chicken and an egg, or you do both things at the same time. Oh. So we first we won the law that gave us this little teeny... What did the law say? Again? The law said... Owners of this particular type of federally regulated housing can sell them at market rate and reap windfall profits, even though the government gave them all the money to build them and they've been subsidized for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Except that before they do it, they have to give a notice to the tenants 
and then the tenants have the right of first refusal. And that was like a stroke of genius to put that into the law. And then that was our organizing handle. So we would organize the tenants. We had to do like a whole market analysis. You can figure out when properties are going to flip, what owners are going to do based on their taxes and whatnot. Then you go in in advance. You organize the tenants and say, your owner's probably going to sell your property. We can buy it. We can, you know, and then it's just a straight up organizing campaign. Was there ever any competition yes. around other people trying to like convince tenants that they mm -hmm. were the ones who should, they should, Mm -hmm. you like the, yeah, you know, and then you organize the tenants and you do direct action. We went after the, a bunch of nonprofits. Non yep, and even real nonprofits who were paternalistic and said, "Oh, yeah, we'll yeah. do a better job because they, we'll just take care of you." Yeah. yeah. And maybe I'm kind of stupid, but the right of first refusal. So then the tenants bought the building, right? Yeah. You bought the building, but you somehow we created new 501c3s made up of the tenants. And which again is now being restructured into an LLC and the larger cooperative now has decision making power as opposed to these little individuals. But then you had to finance the purchase yes. of the building. Yes. So part of the law provided mechanisms for financing. Oh. Yeah. Um, and so there were also state campaigns, there were local campaigns to win CDBG funds, so there were all different mm -hmm. levels of organizing, as you know, to win anything. You have to have your ducks in a row. All these, were the tax, these were the properties that have been tax credit deals? Some of them. So, so that program is now gone. Clinton got rid of it. So right. now so it's were twenty. You could build these things for twenty years. Yep. For twenty years, you got tax credits, and after twenty years, when they expired, they would come up for sale, Pretty right? Much. So, so there are a list of properties that HUD would put out. I'm just, mm -hmm. you know, sort of yeah. reconstructing, but I bet, I, I bet you were able to do here. So you could, I mean, we used to fight them in Bridgeport and a number of other yeah. places where they were coming up. If you could keep them from going to market rate or to whatever or to sell to somebody who would keep the rents down. So what obviously you did is did the research, figured out which ones were coming up in Western Mass on uh, the 20 year and flip, them. and yeah. then you put together the finances and the organ interesting. Yeah, and then you got, you know, we did renovations and did, you know, then we created the jobs and then this whole other model was sort of created. I'm not sure so that little duplicatable in, in Canada. But you got to get that little thing, that little right of first refusal, because so now that law's gone, but there's still housing organizing going on with the goal to buy it at the end of the campaign using just straight up tax credit. So it's more of a straight housing deal. Um, in order to organize, obviously, that takes time, right? So that little caveat in the law gave the tenants an extra window, an extra amount of time to sort of, for us and the organizers to get our shit together, basically. So to compete against um, big private developers, they can just come in and lay a deposit on the table. Um, so now in the free market, it's been much harder to close deals. It's not impossible, um, but it's much harder. So we don't have that little extra window of time. But in the subcontracting world, and this might work in Canada, I mean, we used to negotiate with some of the banks, almost all their ancillary services, even in New York, you know, mm -hmm. land, who was, you know, who was doing the plant supply, who was coming in once a week and checking the plants, yeah. the, you know, janitorial, the blah, 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 were, because of CRA requirements in the U.S., were, were let to nonprofits. So, so in our case, we created all the businesses that serviced right. this whole market, and all of our members got all the jobs and ran the businesses. And in some cases where we didn't create the business, we had a relationship with the company that did it, and they were you know, a socially responsible So that's a little business. bit like the labor model that guy put put together in BC where I was the Columbia Institute guy where I was working at the train program. What was that guy's name who had the, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. you, yeah, you know you lost me there, wait. What labor model? Oh, the guy, that company that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, he'd set up all these businesses. Uh, labor unions essentially had a network of businesses employing yeah. 5,000 cool. people in BC. Sinclair was on the board, O'Neill was on the board, mm -hmm. um, you know, the head of, uh, uh, what's his name, who heads the CL, Canadian yeah, Labor Congress? Huh? I know what you're talking about. His father had been the welfare minister or something in the NDP government in BC, so mm -hmm. he has, you know, sort of, as they say in China, a princeling. Um, but regardless, that was that guy. He'd set up an investment fund, workers' investment fund. They'd bought the businesses, travel agencies, Da 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 had the employment, and then part of the profit went into fund the Columbia, Columbia mm -hmm. Institute, and that's why we were doing the organizer leader training through the Columbia Institute. Now I just can't remember his name, but same, it's, the same, it's the same idea, same basic model. Um, 
So you've organized your market at the same time. You have this captive market. But, you know, using maybe unions as one of our partners in the mm -hmm. air in terms of, I mean, we'd have to look at what, uh, what part of the service sector we thought we could provide through our membership that would also be something we could manage and get profit on. And I would say we had a very strong relationship with labor unions because we also, again, went and organized work sites where they were engaging in wage theft. So the construction company that exists now is not a union company, but minimum wage is $15 an hour plus benefits, so it's raising the floor. So as we go after these other players in the market, right, we're trying to raise the floor, and they said, okay, 15, we all agreed 15 is where we want to move the floor up to, and that's where we're going to be. And so the unions were a partner with us in that. And then all our job sites, when we would do construction, we would have a PLA. It would be all labor, except for our company <laughs> wasn't. <laughs> and in New York City, where we managed, you know, 2,000-plus units of cooperative housing, that was the only union contract we had. That was our maintenance people on those units were all, you know, eventually organized by labor. And we, every, every year, as Mimi and I used to have to go through, you know, what mm -hmm. the bargaining was. But that was, you know the way it was, and, and New York City is a different world, but that used to be my defense. Yeah, we've got a union contract right there with the, you know, construction trades. And then it also gave, like, owning real estate, right, gives you leverage with, with your city government as you pay property mm -hmm. taxes. Um, you're like, you, yeah. you want, you, you're, we moved, we made sure that we were banking in local banks that we got right. things back from, so we moved all of our money into this one bank. It financed the startup of one of our companies. Then we wanted to expand it, and they said, no, we won't give you a loan. And then we were like, well, fuck you, then we're going to move our money to a different bank that gave us the loan. So that's like that power of that real estate and the money that was attached to us made the organization um, far more powerful in, in that city and in the region than it would have been otherwise. And it, I think even more powerful than it lived up to be. <laughs> Could have been more powerful than, than it was at the time. So we've been talking almost a straight hour here. Are there, just keeping an eye on the time and everybody's time here. Are there other questions that we haven't gotten to? But, or questions you wanted to discuss that we hadn't gotten put on the table yet? Or? I mean, it sounds fascinating. I mean, I'd love to try to figure out how to do this. I don't know what question to ask. Unfortunately, I think a lot of, almost every community is sui generis. I mean, it's something yeah. unique to itself. So what That's they've been right. able to do in Western Massachusetts was somewhat amazing and uh, but I, I think the general trend is something obviously we've talked about a lot and are open to conversations about and yeah. we believe and part of the lesson of watching acorn go down was a you know hyper obsessiveness with um, self-sufficiency I mean uh, I think the, the series of judgments for whatever reason made to have the organization go out of business would not have happened if they'd had more control of their finances right, then. Right. and uh, certainly that's my lesson at Acorn International, I think it's a lesson that Acorn Canada has taken to their heart as well. And um, so we're, we're in the market for God knows what kinds of ideas. I mean, unfortunately, there's no simple one, two, three, and it's all solved. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just, you know, add water and stir. Um, but I think where we can find in a Mondragon kind of thing a way to be mutually independent, I mean, you know, if... Uh, you know, we're trying to cut a deal now with VOA to do a, a where they will contract with a coffee roasting operation we run to supply coffee, fair trade coffee, to all of their VOA affiliates in the country. Mm -hmm. And the exchange would be that they're doing a development along the river in New Orleans. We would locate the roaster in their development. Mm -hmm. We'd have a coffee operation there. Um, you know, what's scrap. VOA? Volunteers of America. Oh, okay. Okay. So they do all, uh, you know, That's veterans. Great. How? Well, it's not done either. I mean, well, it's a great idea. We'll see. Uh, yeah, I think it's a great idea, but I haven't sold it yet. Because um, that would obviously, you know, finance our getting a coffee roasting operation, and we'd have a captive market, which is what you need. But, you know. That's, that's part of the Mondragon, the interesting thing. Once you have a market of 100,000 workers in co-ops, then it's, yeah. you, you create other kinds of co-ops that service Right, those it's all co -ops. about the captive so, market and expanding. We called it a wheel, and we would like oh. draw this whole like spiraling okay. wheel. I see, that's even better. Let's call it a wheel. <laughs> so I have like some charts, and I have like a whole reflection piece on sort of what we learned from this. I'd be happy to share it with you. 
Um, is it something you've written recently? It's from a year ago. I've sort of been thinking about updating it, so I will update it. You know, so I keep trying to <laughs> lobby you for a piece of social policy, and you're holding yeah. out with a piece that you have? Yeah, okay. I'm working on it. Yes. It's nowhere well, close to being ready? It, it is, actually. March 1st is our next okay. one. Could I say we've got a piece from you? For... Maybe. We'll follow up on oh, that. Oh, you know, <laughs> don't, don't tell me, you know, call me maybe. Yeah. But I, and I would say, like the the most important. Yeah. You saw you saw that slip through my hands that yeah. quickly with all these witnesses. Maybe. There was and I'm good. I'm good. And there it went right through my hands. Do you guys do like the how to you know that old school training how to cut an issue? Is it winnable? Is it blah 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 blah? Yeah, we care so, about winning. One of the most important, I think, sort of um, light bulb moments for us is when we added. The last criteria. Does this campaign, can we create a new institution owned and controlled by our members that will generate wealth? Adding that changed our thinking about campaigns and it made us think like this whole thing, it's not a chicken and egg, how can we do both things at the same time? And so you might be cutting an issue and say, no, it doesn't. Okay, that's fine. But you might be cutting an issue and say, oh, yes, it does. And then your strategic juices will start flowing about how to expand your community economy or your wheel or your captive market. It's just, it's just an additional way of thinking. It's, an, it's another and our, and our language in ACORN was how does it privilege the base? If there was a way that we could figure out ongoing sustainability that privileged the base, that was mm -hmm. organically rooted mm -hmm. in what our constituency was and what right. service their ongoing things, then that would build the organizational sustainability. Yeah. And that keeps you sort of honest and keeps you from like deciding that something is a good idea when like people might not actually yeah. care. People have to vote with their feet for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Jude, anything else that we haven't? I mean, obviously you saw me fail to get uh, this in social policy, but other than that, I think we've done pretty good here, okay. pretty well. Yeah. It's great to meet you. Other it's questions? Exciting. Scott, Alex? Alex, Marco, I've never gone Marco. to a session where you didn't have a question. 